What is up, everyone? Thank you for making change agents skyrocket in the charts. Listen, we want to hear from you. What subjects do you want Andy to talk on? What agents of change do you want to be guests on change agents? We want your comments below. Tell us what you think. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually it could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. I can't speak for all veterans, but for myself, after leaving military service, I struggled quite a bit to find purpose. And if I'm being totally honest, I'm still navigating my way towards my purpose. It can be challenging. And my guest today found an amazing way to channel his energy and effort and find another purpose. His name is Damian Mander. He's a former Australian Royal Navy clearance diver and special operations military sniper and an Iraq war combat veteran. What you're gonna hear about today is that after his military service, as it does for most, his life took a turn. And he ended up in Zimbabwe, of all places, and he became involved in anti-poaching efforts, particularly stopping the hunting of rhinos, who are poached for their horns, which are used in alternative medicine. And because of their use in traditional Chinese medicine, large rhino horns can go for more than $100,000 each on the black market. Damien is the founder of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, or IAPF, and the group Akashinga, Nature Protected by Women, which was featured in the National Geographic documentary, Akashinga, The Brave Ones. The IAPF's goal is to employ 1,000 women by 2026, protecting 15 million acres of wilderness in Africa. Why do you need that many people? Well, it's a major need. African black rhinos are critically endangered, according to the organization, helping rhinos. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were 500,000 rhinos on Earth. Today, there are less than 30,000. According to the World Animal Foundation, poaching is more than a $20 billion industry. And every 12 hours, a rhino dies at the hands of a poacher. It's also not a very safe job. Protecting rhinos is an extremely dangerous job. From the International Ranger Federation, from 2006 to 2021, more than 1,500 rangers died in the line of duty, averaging about two deaths per week. I was reading you were a diver in the Navy as well, but then you also became uh, a sniper, which two, I'm going to say, very unrelated jobs. So after September 11, the Australian government formed a uh, tactical assault group East. And so that was a mixture of commandos, divers, and SAS. Uh, and they, it was the first time in the history of our defense force, they opened up selection to the entire um, defense force, males, of course, and to the entire Australian public. Uh, and they did all the selections. Um, and at the end of it, there were 60, 60 men left. And those men formed the tag. Um, three three platoons, land, water, and sniper. Being a diver, I went across uh, uh, into water platoon, and I'd been there for two. And I, I struggled, like I really struggled um, to get through the selection, to get onto the course, uh, like just scrape through. Um, it's like the hardest thing I've ever, ever done. Uh, got on team, and I'd been there for two days, and I was told I was going to do sniper's course. So you can't, you can't ask to do it. You're told you're doing it, and. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, then, you know, it was literally like a fish out of water, dude. Like, I, I just remember doing it at first. So, I mean, we had the, the sniper. So you go from you go from selection and close quarter battle and all that, and you've literally got like six dudes around you, like screaming in your head, and you know you've got a, a respirator on, and and you know everything's blacked out, and people, are, you know, pop and smoke, and you know you're shooting live rounds. And then you got a sniper's course and it's a bunch of relaxed dudes and they're like, okay, so this is how you do it. Uh, we're going to show you once. Uh, you either go out and you do it and you pass or you don't and you fail. Like, we're not going to sit here and scream at you. And it was like, it's just a completely different mentality. But 
it was it was harder than than having the the six dudes yelling at you, uh, you know, or, you know, in your face and 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 giving you that pressure, uh, because all the pressure was on yourself now. Uh, yeah. It was it was like, and I remember doing my, my first um, live fire store, and uh, you know, one of the one of the spotters came in, and I was like, I was sort of like half tied in the fork of a tree, and like <laughs> like leaning out, it's just like it's like, dude, like fucking what it. What are you doing? Um, yeah. So what they what they actually did? So this is this was with um, the Australian SAS. So what what they actually did is they took the divers and they put us through uh, a sniper's course first, like as a practice run, so we could actually learn bushcraft, uh, and then they actually put us on the sniper's course, um, so that we 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 got to, got to go through it twice because we just didn't we didn't have that background um, of, of bush warfare and and. Yeah, like how could you? Yeah, it was. You know, I managed to pass the course. Uh, it was online there for a couple of years. Uh, just yeah, um, amazing experience. Um, yeah, and just so you know, a lot of lessons. You know, you. Le- I mean, it's, you know the drill. You yeah. just pick up these little lessons at the time that you don't realize are, are life lessons. And you, I think the, for me with the military and in particular the CEDA, the clearance diver acceptance test, which is our, our hell week. Um, it's just like 12 days of, you know, sleep deprivation and, you know, the four pillars of misery to be hungry, cold, tired, and wet. <laughs> uh, and after doing that, there's never been a time in my life where I've been challenged with something where I haven't been able to look back and draw from that and say, listen, the, the only difference between me uh, and the people that don't want to go ahead with this is that I'm willing to stay here and, and stick it out. And, uh, and that's it's the same with a lot of you know our SF units. We're not a lot of us aren't aren't like you know geniuses like special you know like the yeah. the best the best. We're just the ones that don't fucking give up. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's the person you want next to you, the person that's never going to give up. Let's connect those two. So your military service, right? You started on the uh, the diving side of the house, transitioned over to the special operations side of the house. How did you find your way to Zimbabwe and what you do now? So I finished up. Like in Iraq, didn't like two thousand five, six, and seven uh, in Iraq, and then um, I went to South America. It was like a like a self reward for like a uh, holiday. Yeah, it was a holiday, and it's like a blowout. And I, I, I'd, I'd um, so I, my mum was in real estate, so it encouraged me to start investing in, res- in residential property at a young age. And then all the money that I was I was earning in Iraq, I was just pumping into a you know, that I wasn't spending on leave, I was just pumping into into residential property. So by the time I was like 28, um, I didn't like need to work. Uh, so I was like, I'd done well financially, done well from a military standpoint. Still had 10 figures and 10 toes after after three years in Iraq. And then, so I went to South America and just, uh, yeah, just, you know, what started out as a reward, um, a holiday, turned into a pretty, pretty mad downward spiral. Um, over the next 11 months, um, just, uh, yeah, basically, you know, it was like there were, there were, it's like there were three days a week, Monday to Wednesday break. And then, and then, uh, you know, Friday through to Sunday, uh, and then do it again. Um, it was just, yeah, lots of cocaine and lots of drugs. Um, you know, at the time it seemed like this is awesome, but I wasn't using my brain. <laughs> I didn't have purpose. I didn't have mission. And I didn't have the brotherhood that I've been surrounded um, by for most of the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you're the same, man. You know, we've got a lot of brothers that are no longer with us. And, um, you yeah. know, for, for many people, the the real battle doesn't start until the, until the bullets stop and you've got to try and, you know, you're trained to shoot someone from a mile away. You go, go back and drive a fucking Uber or go and flip some burgers or something. And it's, you know, or, or you know, how to, you know, deal with a, you know, a couple of young kids, you know, yeah, tugging at your trousers and like, you know, yeah, we want to go and play. And it's like, you just, your head's not there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would say rock bottom, um, just in terms of, you know, but lucky enough to realize it and like knew that I, I needed to find something like refine purpose. Uh, and I always knew I wouldn't find that at home in Australia for some reason. It was just like a gut feeling I had. And I'd heard about anti-poaching. And it was, 
yeah, it was just meant to be like a six month thing, just a, another adventure. Uh, but at least one without the, the drugs and alcohol. And, um, yeah, that's, that's how I landed here in Africa. So your first six months, uh, you know, put your toes in the water. Was it just from a volunteer perspective? You wanted to find an organization to help? It was really, it was really hard to get involved. Um, to be honest, Andy, cause I came over, came over looking for a fight, not a cause. I came over thinking, you know, I've got all these skills and they're going to be so welcomed. Uh, and everywhere I went, it's like, you know, we actually, one, you can't get a work permit to come and do this shit. Two, you, you're a foreigner. You can't just be running around with a, with a weapon and, and doing this work. And three, it's a completely wrong mindset to, you know, what in some cases people had spent decades building these projects and these relationships with local communities up. And so, you know, I had, I had to come to this realization myself through experience, and that was traveling around, speaking to different people, meeting different people, uh, and then it was eventually in Zimbabwe, the fifth country that I traveled through, that I got just an opportunity to start working with an anti-poaching unit. And it was it was transformational for me, um, not because I actually got to start working with this unit, but because it it made me like have deep reflection on what my my reasons were for being there. You know, I'd I'd, I'd gone there uh, as I said, looking for a fight, not a cause. I'd just come from Iraq working within a $600 billion a year annual defense budget. We we're fight, fighting for resources in the ground. We got fucking Apaches and drones and uh, everything trying to bring us home safely every day. Any bit of kit we need, thermal, night vision, uh, you know, eating like uh, eating like kings, uh, you know, uh, back at the fobs. And then you see these rangers who are protecting the heart and lungs of the planet and they don't even have boots or, or med kits uh, or comms or ammunition for the weapons if they have weapons. Uh, and, and one of the things they lacked was just the attention, like a person to stand there and give them the time of day to teach them how to do things a little bit differently. And so there was, there was and, 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 you know, so seeing them leave their families behind for up to 11 months of the year working for a couple of hundred bucks a month, um, that combines with uh, what they were fighting for, uh, the wildlife, and then seeing the wildlife side, like the animals that were being killed. Um, like this was there's a bu- there was a bunch of shit going on inside inside of me, a culmination of of going right back to childhood, building up this persona, uh, maintaining this image, um, having that to some degree broken down uh, the layers of armor that you build around yourself. Um, over three years in Iraq, uh, hitting rock bottom in South America, and then coming to Africa, and 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 there's a combination of experience and then just time, uh, and, and maturity, and you 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 start to have a different lens through which to see the world. And if you'd put me in Africa a decade before and and hoped for the same outcome, you wouldn't have got it. You know, I, I had to go through those steps to finally be in a position one day to say, okay, fuck, I'm here. Uh, there's a problem. Uh, I've got funding and I've got a certain set of skills and I've got time on my hands to try and make a difference here. Uh, do I want to go and do something else? And I actually did. I wanted to be a chef. Uh, I watched too much of Anthony Bourdain. Um, <laughs> uh, do, do I, do I want to go and be a chef uh, or do I want to stay here and try and, try and make some sort of change and that you know that attempt to try and make some change became purpose and the thing about purpose uh and trying to trying to do something that you believe is right is that it becomes infectious uh it's it's not it's not like something that you just jump in on day one and it's all there but it it grows uh and it just it keeps growing and growing and growing and as the momentum builds um you start to figure things out uh you know the formula gets better, it gets refined. Uh, you know we work. You know we've got some some investors from uh, Silicon Valley, and it's it's what they call founder market fit. It's when they they invest in in someone that's fucked everything up so many times along the way that they've finally figured out how to get it right um, by going through going through the all those difficult challenges. And you know we're still refining what we do as an organization, but we we've come through it the hard way and I think we're in such an innovative space at the moment in terms of what we're doing in terms of the scale that we're achieving economically geographically organizationally 
uh, ideologically. Uh, you know, we, we are changing the way that conservation is done. Uh, and it's, it's very different to how we started out as an organization um, back in 2009 when I registered IAPF, the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. It's 180 degrees from, from being the good guy with a gun out there as the last line of defense. Uh, it's social impact to achieve conservation outcomes. That's where we're at at the moment. Well, unpack that for me. I mean, explain to me the size, scope, and scale of what it is you're doing now. And then if you could talk to me about, I feel like I should be do some of that Silicon Valley money because I have fucked up so many things in my life. I'm definitely ready for (laughs) some backing. (laughs) 45 years of stumbling my way through life like an idiot. You know, we, we started in 2009 and we scaled up doing these, like focusing on the security aspect of conservation. And that was predominantly ranger training, uh, security operations. Uh, and that's like, I just fell into cadence with that component of the industry, not really understanding that it's, it's a wedge of a, a much, you know, a much bigger picture. Uh, I fell into cadence with that because that was my background. That was my skills. Uh, and that's what excited me, you know, like, okay, great. We got, we got you know, a team of, of 18 poachers that we know are crossing the Zambian border coming into Zimbabwe tonight. They've got a heavy caliber rifle. They've got automatic weapons. Uh, you know, we're, we're it. We're the last line of defense. You know, let's go out there and, and, and protect these, you know, elephant and rhino. Uh, and, um, and we scaled up uh, the organization over the coming years and started taking on uh, projects around the region, uh, in Mozambique, South Africa, uh, um, I was accused um, in 2012 of espionage in Zimbabwe. Um, lost, uh, it was fal- falsely accused. There was an article that appeared in in front page of Australian newspapers uh, about former uh, special forces spies operating in Zimbabwe. Um, oh. I was guilty by association. Um, I was outside the country at the time. I was told not to come back into the country. Uh, otherwise I'd be questioned and potentially trial for espionage, which, which has a death sentence here. Uh, and so I had to turn my back on the life savings that I just invested, the money from the five houses I just sold, the house that I just built, and I was living uh, uh, in a backpackers in a shitty part of Johannesburg with $2,000 left in the bank. And um, like that is like seriously back against the wall shit. And um, uh, we came, it took two and a half years to clear our name. During that time, we registered the organization in South Africa. We started doing projects there. Uh, we found a, a very uh, strategic project in regards to rhino conservation in Mozambique along the border of Kruger National Park, which at the time was home to around 30% of the world's remaining rhino. We were working on a project in Mozambique and you know we had... A, any one day, 11 armed units crossing through the section that we were protecting into Kruger National Park uh, to, to hunt rhino, uh, which is selling for 35,000 US dollars a pound. You know, a rhino can have 10, 20 pounds of, of horn on it. Uh, so it's like you've got something that should be locked up in a safe running around an area the size of a small country. Uh, and so we, we went out there and we set up a ground level offensive against the local population in Mozambique where these syndicates were operating from. Uh, and every day, you know, we had the chopper up, we had the, the, the free running, uh, canine, uh, tracking teams. Uh, you know, we had drones, thermal night vision. Uh, we built big, big offenses and we bought in more guns and we had this, this ongoing war with the communities that surrounded the area we were trying to protect. Uh, it's just, you know, I spend about three months a year in the U.S. lecturing, and and you know, like I, I speak for National Geographic on the Speakers Bureau. I used to, you know, do my talks and say, "Listen, you know, what we're doing is not the solution. You know, think of us as a paramedic. We're just trying to get yeah. the situation to the operating table. Uh, we, we're trying to we're trying to stop the hemorrhaging. We don't know what the solution is, but having an, a sustained war with the local population, it, it, I don't think there's a, a, a credible example in history of a foreign force or an occupying force having a a, um, a long-term good relationship with the local population uh you know and I, you know we, we're both part of of, of being uh within those systems that we know it doesn't fucking work uh and we were doing the same thing repeating the same mistakes that i'd been involved with in iraq uh 
uh, we're repeating them in conservation. We're bringing in groups of people that weren't from the local area and trying to defend it defend an area that it was traditionally owned by the locals but they weren't allowed to come in there mm. but a, a a european hunter could come across and shoot you know pay the right money and shoot something and you know so all of this i'm thinking you know this this you've got to figure out a way to rebuild the bridge that was broken between conservation and communities and it led it led me into a lot of research uh into other industries that were getting ahead by getting more women on, on boards uh, as CEOs um, in management positions and power roles within organizations. Uh, we looked at uh, women in law enforcement, not only in Africa, around the world, women that were uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, they're using all female counterinsurgency teams supported by special forces to go in and negotiate uh, because there's only so many times you can kick someone's door in at three o'clock in the morning and point at fucking uh, a, a, a gun barrel in their face and then try to turn up the next day and, and sit around and, and drink tea. Yeah. True uh, story. It, it's the, the, when the relationship is broken, it's, it's shattered and, and rebuilding that, that, that trust and that relationship, uh, we needed a different approach. Um, we looked at, um, we looked at conservation and women were given very limited access, uh, to operational roles. Uh, which gave them limited opportunity to rise up into management positions because they weren't gaining the experience necessary. Uh, and so we thought, well, you know, what if we were to, you know, on a continent that's going to have 2 billion people by 2040, if we don't figure out the social side, uh, then we're going to end up with just a, a small amount of parks that are heavily protected by military hardware. Uh, and that, that is not a good global solution for anyone. Um, and so, you know, other research telling us, you know, overwhelming body of evidence that is empowering women is the single greatest force for positive change in, in rural Africa and in the world. Uh, you know, and as you know, us two sitting here coming from the ultimate boys club of special operations, uh, and you know, I've built a career across three continents in training training men only uh, for for combat and law enforcement. I, you know, this idea was. Look, the data and the research was stacking up, but the you know wasn't it was it was a completely foreign concept. Uh, we found an abandoned trophy hunting reserve in Zimbabwe, uh, uh, with trophy hunting in decline and so much land wilderness across Africa set aside for trophy hunting. It's like this area is either going to be lost to agriculture, uh, or human settlement, or you know we we can come in with an alternate model. Um, and that's the only reason we got to, got a start. With these women because we got stopped uh, i think it was seven other reserves that we tried to trial this program nobody wanted to take the risk of putting women into a, tr a traditionally male role um, and we started um, the criteria was survivors of sexual assault domestic violence aids orphans single mothers abandoned wives and uh yeah as soon as we started with the, the selection process uh yeah we saw straight away that we had something very unique very different that Anything you or me went through um, in our selections was nothing compared to what their life had been uh, leading up to that. Uh, so, yeah, the, the 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 spirit and character, which is the only two things uh, we look for in a ranger to begin with. We can train the rest. We want spirit. And we want character. And these women had it in spades, and that that is where this program started. Uh, from sixteen women under a chalkboard uh, in the in the Lower Zambezi Valley of of Zimbabwe, uh, on a hunting reserve, former hunting reserve of 90,000 acres to having 9.1 million acres, uh, under contract now across four countries, um, and a staff heading towards 600 people. That's unbelievable. And what you're talking about specifically is the, uh, Akishanga, right? That's the all female group. Akishanga, yeah. Yeah. It's a name that they gave themselves. That means the brave ones. Yeah. How big do you foresee that that program could become? So we, we have an ambition to have 30 million acres under contract by 2030. Um, and these contracts uh, are in direct partnership with local communities. Uh, so there's more than twice as much land or wilderness area in Africa that's held under communal or tribal land trust than what there are national parks that's, that are held as part of a federal system. So we're working directly with indigenous local indigenous communities to protect uh, uh, their wilderness areas 
where hunting or trophy hunting has been a traditional economic model and tr- uh, hunting is failing. Uh, there's less animals to shoot uh, in many of these countries. Uh, there is less people that were wanting to come over um, and shoot these animals. And then there's tougher regulations. For example, the US Fish and Wildlife Service banned the importation of Zimbabwe ivory uh, in 2017 uh, into the US. That was 52% of the market lost overnight. Another area um, in in Botswana that we've we've recently gone into partnership with with the communities is two million acres. Now, previously, the entire hunting quota of that was purchased by Russians, and with Russia at war and under sanctions, they're not coming out to shoot. And so, like all these areas stand to be lost unless we can come in with an alternate model. Uh, I, I used to be a hunter. I'm not a hunter anymore. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to fuck with anything that can't defend itself. Um, I know what it's like to be hunted. Um, you know, that's my position. Um, but we don't want to look at hunting as an argument to be had, rather equa- an equation to be solved. The areas that we go into are areas where hunting is is failing. And if there is not an alternate model, uh, then these, are- these, these wilderness areas will be lost. The animals will be poached. The trees will be cut down. The water will stop flowing. Uh, and so like you get, you get frustrated with, you know, there's such a strong anti-sentiment hunting like vibe around the world. Okay. It's great. You got, you, you know, from an ethical standpoint, you, you guys have got a point. Okay. We don't want to go out and shoot something just for the sake of fucking hanging it over the fireplace. But what's worse than that is not having a, an, and what, okay. You want to stop hunting, but, and what, what's going to replace that? Because when you switch hunting off. Okay, the funding there, you no longer have the vehicles, you no longer have the anti-poaching unit, you no longer have the community programs, uh, uh, the the fees that go into the local communities. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here as an advocate for hunting. I'm sitting here as, yeah. a, okay, if the people out there want to stop hunting, want to make such a loud noise about it, then you've got you to back alternate plans because when you switch that shit off, it causes more damage than you can imagine. Well, you're talking about, yeah, it's the ecosystem that you were talking about before. You know, you could have a paddock full of rhinos, but if you destroy the rest of the ecosystem, what have you actually accomplished? You yeah. Have to, you have to look at it in its totality, not just one arrow in the quiver. Exactly. And it's, I mean, it's it's the same as uh, the model we use now. It's it's a holistic model of conservation. It's, it's conservation is not a conservation issue. It's a social is- issue. You need to find the best channels for social impact to achieve a conservation outcome, and that is... Uh, gender equality, local employment, education, healthcare, clean water, infrastructure. Uh, sports has been a, a, a recent one that we've got involved with. 33 uh, soccer teams, 17 netball teams. Um, we had a massive downturn in uh, in crime during uh, in local crime and poaching during that time because people were busy training and playing sport. How sophisticated are the poaching operations that your rangers are coming across? Look, it varies from area to area. Um, the information networks are, are, are extremely good. Uh, the, the the skills of the people um, that have been doing this for a long time and being able to evade, capture are, are exceptional. Uh, you know, you're talking about people that, uh, you know, I mean, we've got we've got rangers uh, that are former poachers, but you're talking about people that can track uh, on dusk. At a running pace, uh, another human being. Uh, it, it's. I don't it think people is, realize how hard that is. No, it's <laughs> it's. Uh, and I, you've got you know, and then they're then they're out there like, you know, on a on a expedition, these guys can walk a hundred miles. You know, and they're they're sleeping out there. The you know the biggest threat is not the rangers trying to stop them, it's the animals they're trying to poach. It's the same for us. Our biggest threat is not the poachers we're trying to stop; it's, it's the actual animals we're trying to protect. Uh, and it's it's uh, you know it's, it's it's a remote, relentless, ruthless, rugged terrain. And when something goes wrong, there's no fucking ruby slippers to take you home. You are in the middle of nowhere. And like these poachers, you know, you know I've got respect for them. Uh, you know, there's there's a level of respect because of of how hard they are and the job that they do. And uh, you know, it's obviously something that we, you know, is part of our mandate to try and stop. Uh, and a lot of that is through motivating communities to see the benefits of conservation, the social impact that comes from biodiversity conservation, and that they're linked. And it's not just a bunch of people running out, around out there with guns trying to stop poachers. You know, there's a, there's a whole string of things that are attached because that gives us 
that gives us the leverage to go and sit down with the chief and say, like, chief, we're going to sit with local government and say, hey, like, guys, you know, we there's been a fair bit of poaching in this particular area over the last few weeks, you know. We, we need you guys through the traditional systems to go and sort this out. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to be like come in and, and make the arrests. I don't, I don't want to spend the rest of my life like arresting people and putting them in jail. I can see like the, the judicial system here in Zimbabwe in particular, we can arrest someone on a Monday with ivory and by Wednesday they've started a nine year sentence. It's automatic. It's a nine year sentence. Wow. Yeah. And they enforce it. Hey, yeah. And we've, in the last four years, I think we've made nearly 1,200 arrests for nearly 800 prosecutions um, at a, a conviction rate of around, I think, 83 or 84%. So it's, it's, there's a, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, and that, that has broken down a lot of syndicates, uh, broken down a lot of, you know, poaching that was taking place. It's caused uh, us to be able to measure almost 400% increase in wildlife populations. But it also disrupts communities. Um, you know, when men are going to prison, um, you know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, it's such a complex thing from a moral and a personal standpoint, but at the same time, you know, look at where we are at, at this point in history, we have to, we have to draw, draw a line in the sand and say, all right, like we, if we don't hold on to what we have left, then there's going to be nothing left. And that's the hard part of the job that we do is that moral dilemma at the end of the day. Um, and so all it does is it motivates us more to keep evolving our program and, and, and keep building out the the social aspect of what we do. Do you think there's any way to attack the problem from upstream as well and figure out a way to reduce or destroy demand either for ivory or the rhino horn? Yeah. So look, look, there's, there's, so there's, there's multiple aspects, you know, from social development to anti-poaching to local laws and regulations to transnational crimes, uh, syndicates to following the money, uh, to targeting the kingpins, uh, to demand reduction. And there's organizations that specialize in uh, the demand reduction side. And Wild Aid, uh, run by a, a colleague, Peter Knights, is a, is a fantastic organization that's working in particular in Asia uh, to try and reduce demand um, for, for some of these these products. And that's their dance space. Like that's that's where like they, they excel at. Uh, and it's as important as the work that we're doing on the ground in, in preserving these, these, you know, that's, this is our dance space. I think when you try to do too many things, uh, you, you, you know, you become the, the, you know, what do they say? The jack of all trades, master of none. Yep. And I'm my, my former commanding officer, uh, you know, when I started out and we're trying to do all these different things, he said, Damien, just fucking pick two things <laughs> really good at them. And of course I kept trying to do everything and then, you know, some years later, you think, okay, but some things you need to figure out the hard way. Yeah. What's the biggest hurdle that the IAPF is facing right now? The, the, the biggest challenge is getting people around the world to understand the importance of looking after nature. And I, let, let me frame this for you. Um, in 2021 in the United States, uh, the largest philanthropic market in the world, there was $449 billion given to philanthropy. 29% of that went to religion. You come down the list, 14% went to healthcare, down some further, 8% to education. At the very bottom, grouped up is all environmental causes, all conservation, all animal causes, both domestic and wild. So your rhinos, uh, your elephants, uh, bears, polar bears, seals, cats, dogs, cattle, all of that grouped up collectively makes up 3%. So we spend 97% of our philanthropic heart and mind uh, on ourselves without realizing that if we don't protect nature, then we're going to be the ones that suffer. And so I think that's the biggest challenge is, is, trying, to, is trying to get people to understand that, you know, that you, you know, we've got to think, we've got to think a little bit into the future. Uh, you know, what sort of legacy are we going to leave as a generation? I don't want to be uh, a part of the generation that, that that leaves things in a worse state than what we found them. Uh, I'd say, like, it, I mean, I love a fucking good scrap, and we have the scrap <laughs> of, of all history on our hands at the moment. And, uh, you know, it's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm happy to be right in the middle of it. I would rather be doing nothing else than what we do at the moment than 
than than fighting for the future of of you know us as a species. Do you think you'll focus the rest of your life on conservation, or do you have any other personal aspirations beyond what you're doing now? Oh, no, man. Uh, just this is it. You know, this is uh, yeah. You know, it's, is Zimbabwe uh, home for you now? Yeah, I've been here for 14 years, minus the two and a half years where I was uh, for Sun and on gratis. But uh, yeah, no, this is um, uh, you know the the two programs that we run, the Lead Ranger program, uh, training instructors from. You know, we've trained over 200 instructors now from nine countries that oversee a workforce of 5,000 people in their own organizations that help protect 20 million acres. Uh, and then our other program, as I said, grown to almost 600 staff, but, you know, building out the programs to protect 9.1 million acres. If all I did for the rest of my life was, was grow those programs, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my time. So how do we get, how do we get somebody who is born and raised in the, bustling metropolis of Sydney or New York or LA to realize that their choices in general, whether whether it's where they direct their energy or where they choose to uh, donate their money, that what you are doing ties into the ecosystem of the world that they are living in. Because I feel like that's the biggest hurdle for most people is they couldn't even find Zimbabwe on the map. For most people, let's let's be yeah. honest. Which is, I, yeah. I don't have a judgment of that. How do we get those people to care? So, I mean, like, I mean, I can I can throw some numbers at you, uh, just to, just just to show you that what we're doing at a local level, uh, and, and in Africa is having global impact. I mean, our our goal to have thirty million acres under contract by twenty thirty, thirty million acres is equivalent to the amount of natural forest that's lost across the world each year. So you're talking about a significant amount of trees that are being protected. Those trees serve a a, a global ecosystem service uh, in regards to mitigating climate change uh, and giving us the, the air that we breathe. Uh, in terms of carbon that's stored in the existing portfolio that we had, you know, we crunched the numbers and did like a ballpark. Um, the carbon that's sequestered. Uh, um, it's the same as if I was to switch off all of Manhattan for 191 days uh, a year. Okay, it's the same as 258,000 flights on a 747, fully laden with 524 people uh, from Los Angeles to New York. So that's the amount of carbon that would be released if all the trees and vegetation and soil would be ruined in the areas that we're currently protecting. So, you know, these are... These are, and it's it's not just about what we're doing. We've formed something called the Conservation Landscape Alliance. Uh, we're working with other partners to help them build out landscape scale solutions. So uh, the largest possible conservation projects and, and corridors of biodiversity that we can have within a single political boundary. Uh, and and it, just between the two founding partners, we want to have 60 million acres secured by the end of the decade. So there, it, there's... You know, people might say, oh, this is Africa and, you know, they're looking after the, the rhinos or the elephants or that, but it's, it's not just that. You know, this is, this is, you know, Africa stands to lose the most amount of wilderness out of any continent on the planet uh, over the next decade, okay? But it also stands to be able to protect, protect the most. Uh, and so what this, what this can service uh, to a global community, I mean, it, you, you, it, it, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to comprehend uh, or even, you know, overstate the importance um, of preserving nature, and it's not just us as an organisation. It's 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 anyone that's involved in conservation and looking to do it at scale. Uh, you know, there's a role for everyone to play. Uh, there's, you know, not everyone's going to get on a plane and fly to Africa and and you know, start up a, a non-profit and you know, try to do what we do. But there's decisions that we can make in our everyday life on 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 how we can make multiple small changes that add up and I think the biggest mistake is to think that small changes don't add up to something they do uh you know it's it's uh you know just us as individuals you know nature as I said has had five billion years to evolve we don't have five billion years we've got a fucking handful of decades you know cut away the bits that don't work keep the bits that do keep moving forward and for me that that means like how can I keep improving the way that I I live my daily life uh, and what changes can I make, whether to the organisation, to myself, uh, that that's going to you know contribute to to making the world a better place. 
I think most people, and to include myself, I'll get caught in this sometime. You just, your whole world becomes what you see and touch just with your fingers yeah. and in your eyes. And you know, you're limited yeah. by the distance of the horizon that you can see, whether that's in New York and you can see a few blocks or where I live in Montana, you can see for 30 miles. But I do agree with you that the interconnected nature of our world, we'd be better served if more people thought about it from that perspective, as opposed to just the little pin drop of existence that we seem to have geographically isolated for our own. Yeah. And it, it's the, the costs, the costs that we're going to pay in terms of dealing uh, with the climate crisis and with the increased environmental um, issues uh, it is going to far outweigh the investment that's needed to hold on to what we have left. Yeah. I just want to leave people with hope. You know, this isn't a lost cause, you know, and it's, it's not, it's not a, our children's responsibility and it, and it, and it wasn't our, our parents it's everyone's responsibility we all have a role to play in 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 leaving this planet a better place than when we arrived here uh, and we need to we need to understand with absolute certainty that if we do not do that as a collective as a global community uh, moving together as one uh, then you know this planet, uh, this planet uh, survived a lot worse than human beings and will continue to do so. We are guests here. We are guests. Uh, and how long we remain guests is up to us. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you want to learn more about Damien's work and the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, please go to iapf.org. That is India Alpha Papa Foxtrot.org. And of course, check out the National Geographic documentary, Akashinga, The Brave Ones.